Proverbs chapter 17, and this is the amplified version. Did I, did my, do I lose it? No. Okay, Proverbs chapter 17, and this is the amplified. It's very short. And I have three passages I want to read with you real quick. Proverbs 17 reads, A happy heart is good medicine. A happy heart is good medicine. And of course, I wanted, if I could put parentheses there, I would put a laughing heart is good medicine. Then, of course, Colossians um, chapter 3 says, it says, Let the message about Christ in all its riches fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. I guess God likes the hymnal. You guys can get that. It's the red book. Oh, okay. That's not going to work today. Okay. Ecclesiastes. Okay. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. This is the New Living Translation. I'm going to put those up there sometimes because as I'm reading various uh, versions, uh, some of you have the King James Version. Okay. Put these in the vows. Okay. And it says, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to cry, and a time to laugh. Tell your neighbor, are you ready to laugh? Okay. I know that's something that we don't do as frequently, because that's what they say. Adults laugh 15 times a day. I'm going to count those every time I wake up in the morning. I'm going to blow that up. Because I know we laugh more than that. Why is laughter difficult for some believers? And are saying, well, Pastor Bill, why are you generalizing? You think about that. Why is, it, why is it that these studies show that we as adults, we don't laugh as frequently? And I think it, it, it's it, we're dealing with believers. And it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And it says, <laughs> it, it's... It takes us to these verses, and I'm, I'm kind of stuttering with this because I'm trying to figure out for some reason, it's a time to laugh. And I think what happens in, for many of you, can I see those people that are 60 and above? 60 and Okay, 60. Okay, I'm not. Okay. I know some people are kind of hesitant to put their hands up. Okay, but I think some of us were raised in a church environment where... You're not allowed to laugh. You've got to show reverence to the Lord. And there's a proper place for that in the church, right? And I guess that was a good teaching that you should come into church and be reverent. But I think when we look at the word reverent, I mean, we do. We show reverence to the Lord because He is God. He is the creator of the universe. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. He's majesty. He's all those things, right? So we extol God. We exalt Him. But the thing is, is God is the creator of laughter also. Amen. And so when I think about that we should be people that seek out laughter, I'm still trying to figure out why is it so difficult for us as adults to laugh. And I think there's something what we call it before Christ and after death. B.C. So in other words, when you became a Christian, you had that old nature. It says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ for I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen? And I think that there's that process that we teach in Christianese, big long word called sanctification. And it's a process of what happens when you become a Christian in the very beginning, and you have this old baggage, you have this old nature, you have your old ways, and maybe you were a, a sour person before. Maybe you were mean-spirited before. But now that you're in Christ Jesus, as says, anyone that is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen? Amen. The old is gone and the new has come. Yes. So, again, that was then, this is now. So now you have the joy of the Lord is your strength for the joy of my salvation, right? From that day forward, God imputed into you this joy. So you should be one of those individuals that just automatically turns up a thermostat when you come into a building or when you come into a room. You should light up the building. 
why aren't we like that? Why don't we come into a room and when people see us, they should automa automatically see us for who we are? I mean, we should be, you know, in fact, again, there should have been a transition for those of us that were once, can I say this word, sourpuss? Okay, I just want to make sure. Oh, Pastor Ben cussed in church. Okay, let's say you were one of those in the beginning, and then all of a sudden, they should have seen a transition in your life. Or again, in our word, a transformation in your life. Where you were once sour, and then all of a sudden you come to work because the joy of the Lord is your strength, and you become more bubbly. There's something different about you. There's a certain continence when you come into the, to the workplace or you come to school and your friends notice, what's different about you? What's different about you? And then you tell them, because I received Jesus Christ in my life. Jesus came into my life. Of course, that's a hard thing to do, to share to your friends that now you got, some people call it, you got religion. You didn't get religion, you got relationship. Amen. And for you to share that, and the thing is to be able to share that with uh, these facial expressions. You know, they say it takes less, less, more muscles to make these two things crown up to your cheekbones. You know, to smile. Uh, you know, I wonder about that because sometimes I've seen a lot of your portraits in your homes. And I'm wondering because it's, it's like we're Christians and I think maybe we have learned the Calvin Klein way to pose and pictures where we don't like to smile. We, we all, I think that's the way we are as Christians, that we don't want to show our teeth. And I, you know, I'm not, maybe I shouldn't be judging in that sense, but the thing is, is I figure if you're a happy person because of what Jesus Christ has done in your life, and I have been, one time I had my foot in the grave and now I'm heaven bound, I had a life that was a, a life of self-destruction, but now God has given me a life of fulfillment and joy. I had a life where I had no kind of direction because now I'm in Christ Jesus. I have a destiny. So I know I have these various things that have taken place in my life. And because of those things, I come into room and I should light up the room. Amen. I should seek out laughter. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that God has given each and every one of us and because of this laughter you know it should just be automatic to take a picture I think we should learn to smile more because we know it doesn't take a lot I mean they say it's harder to frown than it is to smile I'm trying to look at you guys and I'm seeing a lot of people are, don't give me that that's not real genuine you're just smiling because I'm speaking on this because I'm looking at you yeah there you go where's sister Brad <laughs> That's the way you should sing. I mean, I remember when we were in the choir, you know, Pastor Ben used to be a practicing guy. And we used to have a, I think we had almost 100 people in our choir. We had a lot of people in St. George's. And we used to have a choir director who was so mean. I mean, and she's not here, so I can talk about it. It's the Christian way. Okay. It's like prayer meetings. We come to prayer meetings because we want to hear all the stuff that people are up against, right? The gossip. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. Okay, I'm just, that's what I'm trying to wonder. Maybe that's why people don't come to prayer meetings because they don't want to devour what they're up against. Okay, stop that. Okay. I've been, I was involved in this choir and I knew that when we had practice at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and if you were there at 9 o'clock, you were late. And our choir director would tell us if we sang out of tune, if we didn't do anything correctly, we were cleaning the church. So they found ways to punish us. They were very punitive there. And the thing is, is we would never come together to sing a song. We'd always sing in other rooms, and we would learn our parts. And then we would only come together towards the end of the day. Choir practice was long. We didn't get to... Lunchtime was 12, and I used to always look at my watch. I was a growing boy. 12 o'clock rolled around from 9 o'clock, and we still didn't have lunch. And they weren't Pentecostals. They didn't provide lunch for you. 12.30 rolled around, and guess what? She was dismissed, and guess what? We, didn't get, we were always looking to see if she was going to take us somewhere to get something to eat. Was there something in the 
auditorium somewhere? Nope. Nope. See you next Saturday. And so, I, again, she was very strict, and I used to always think to myself, and I was just a young kid at the time, and I would say, and we're supposed to be loving people. She was the meanest person to me. I can say that because she's not here. I mean, she was mean, and I never seen her really smile. You know, even when we, you know, again, I thought it was a performance because she would do these gyrations, you know, when she was, uh, and if we, we sang out of tune or we didn't give her enough because she would always go like this with us because she didn't give us enough, I was like, and we're supposed to, we are Christians by our, our love. And I used to always say that, and here I grew up, and I was always thinking, why wasn't that lady ever really nice to us? And I think, I think back at that, and I said, I know why she wasn't nice to us. I think back, okay, remember, there's a double-edged sword here. Why wasn't she ever really nice to us? Were we ever compliant? Were we ever those kind of people that did what she told us to do? Were we fun-loving people? You already know my history growing up, right? So I'm just reminding you that there's always a reason why people behave the way they behave. And I found out later on this lady was a very sweet lady. Somehow, some way, the choir had a way of just <sighs> getting under her skin. So, um, God has called us to, to seek out laughter, and it's something we should do on a regular basis. It should be, you know, our livelihood. Secondly, I want to look at some passages here, Proverbs 15, verse 30. It says, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart, and good news makes good health. I want to emphasize the word cheerful and the word look, a cheerful look. And I think it's important when we think about how we as individuals carry ourselves where we are. In other words, how do people perceive us? Because perception to Christians, the Apostle Paul says, what? Follow me as I follow the Lord. And so again, people are always going to look at it. If you, don't, if you don't like being placed under a microscope, being a Christian, you will be looked at. If you profess out loud that I am a Christian, people will be looking at you like, a, like you're under a microscope. Your, your life will be a reflection of your belief in Jesus Christ. And some people say, well, that's unfair. Well, the, the thing is, is, of course it's unfair. The world's unfair. But the thing is, is, are you that type of individual that looks and rises up to the challenge and saying that these individuals are looking at me and because they're looking at me, my testimony as a Christian needs to look like this. And you should mirror Christ in your life. Amen. And those, those, what are they? The fruit of the Spirit? Those should be, literally, they should come out of you every time you are at work. And I work in a high stress environment. And I'm talking about my secular job. A high stress environment where people's lives are at stake and there's, it, it's a very time constraining that we have to kind of take, let's say, uh, so that you have an understanding. People come on these dialysis machines and they need to get there maybe uh, 30 minutes before their time. And let's say their time is at 8 o'clock, so they're at 7.30. And from 8 o'clock till 10 o'clock, uh, I would say 8 o'clock to that for three more hours, they got out at 11. And from 11 to 11.30, that's a long day. Think about having 23 people come in roughly in a, a one hour window coming in to depend on this equipment and then another 20 people that come in after them. So you got 20 people going out and 20 people coming in. High stress. The thing is, is when you work with people, unbelievable people, great team, great team effort, and they just love being with each other and they they're funny, they have great sense of humor. And then the people that are, are our patients, they come in and some of them aren't feeling well. They're, 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 they're not feeling well, but then when they come in, they see a person who exhibits kindness. An uh, individual that automatically has this love in their heart and then they 
you know, they, they, we understand that they're not feeling well, but somehow, some way, because of this random act of kindness, we just come in there and, and help people out. Let me share a little thing. When I used to be one of those individuals that would, did perform patient care, I had this one Hispanic lady, for some reason, she, she couldn't get from her wheelchair to the recliner. And every time there was a girl to help her do that, some way they ended up getting this thing called a Hoyer lift. And it's things that get patients and bring them. Well, when it was a guy, she would always say, oh, she would reach up, right? Well, here I was helping her. And then all of a sudden I said, I can't believe that she can't get up. Then I asked, this is like God thing gave me this. How does she get around at home? Right? That was wisdom, right? How does she get around at home? So I asked her. I said, Senora, how do you, you know, I asked her, how do you get around at home? She goes, oh, I can. So then I, she told me, she puts her hands up, and I could tell maybe she just wanted a hug, right? Because <laughs> I would always get under her, and she would want to put her arms, and I would literally lift her up and then put her down in a chair. Well, I told her, I says, I think you could do this on your own, right? I said, I'll just help you, right? And she goes, no, 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 I, I, I can't. I'm thinking, you just said you get around at home. So then all of a sudden, everybody said, oh, what is Ben doing? What is Ben doing? I mean, he's going to bring drama over there, right? So I said, I'll help you. So I grabbed her hands and I helped her. She got up. Everybody saw that. It was almost like a vacuum. I helped her out of her chair. She took two steps and sat down. As soon as she sat down, I go, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> and everybody started clapping, excuse me. They started laughing and, and clapping. And I was like, just to poke fun at her. I mean, but she, she got it. She, she kept doing this. And of course, she brought me some tamales the next time she came around. <laughs> she loved me. You know, and, and again, it's a reminder to us just these random acts of kindness that we can give to other people. And I think that's what God has entailed for us this, this morning. I want to share this next text with you because this kind of gives us a picture about our own God. Matthew 19. This started, Jesus is already in full uh, bloom in his ministry and he's, he's, you know, a lot of things have taken place already. And then all of a sudden, these are these children, so you grab what the culture is, is handling. Many of these children that are kind of, I'll call it, they're loose in the community, a lot of them are orphans. If you get a chance to read this text, it says, Then the people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place their hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. I want you to grab a picture of that. These are these kids coming to Jesus. Verse 14, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. And so I'm trying to grab this one picture of our Jesus. You ever see a picture or a portrait of Jesus? You know, the European rendering of Jesus? He always looks so stoic, huh? I mean, have you ever seen a picture of Jesus laughing? I'm trying to capture the picture of my Jesus playing with kids. How does Jesus look like when he plays with kids? I mean, does he, does he laugh with them? Are they jumping on him? Do they grab his leg? Does he grab them? Does he reach out? Does he touch them? Jesus was a friend to kids. His disciples thinking that maybe he was like a, a dignitary. You know, because he was the king of kings and the lord of lords, and all of a sudden here are these kids that are running towards Jesus, and they said, stop! They were like bodyguards. You can't come near Jesus. And I, I figured, Jesus must have been indignant. Those are little kids. I love kids. Let them come. And he's showing us a picture of how he has fun. My Jesus, who's the creator of the universe, takes the time to enjoy life. And he allowed the kids to come. I'm just trying to envision him grabbing kids and just throwing them in the air and catching them. But we can't picture our God like that. We picture God as being almighty. You know, we always picture God as the vastness of God, but we can't make God personal. And that's why God is trying to come down to our level, literally, and say because he was what? Fully man and fully God? 
that God can laugh, and God can enjoy life, and God can reach out. If God can reach out and touch a leper and tell the leper, I have empathy for you because nobody else will touch you, how much more would God reach out and take a child in his arms and wrap him and wrap them in his loving arms? and just enjoy life with them. So this is what I'm trying to show us this morning when we think about this. Laughter a day, it says, a cheerful look brings joy. Do we take every opportunity to enjoy life's pleasures? Something very simple in life. How do we seize the opportunity to enjoy life this morning? I mean, life can't be about the, what do we call it, the grind. I apologize to all of you that just finished school. I remember I used to tell the girls when they graduated from college, and after they graduated from college, I says, we stand out there and I go, now after you've done all your years in school, you've got to do the grind. What is the grind? You get up in the morning, I don't know what time you get up. You get up in the morning, whether it's 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, you get to go to work, you go to work, do all your damn time at work, and then you come back, you eat, you sleep, you go to work the next morning, and it goes over and over and over and over and over, right? Everybody's depressed. <laughs> That's the grind. But the thing is, is can we take the opportunity to enjoy, in between that, life's pleasures? That's what God wants us to do, to enjoy life. You know, those of us, you know, I, I know that there are some of you that are workaholics. Uh, you know what a workaholic is? Those are people that just love work. I mean, they sponge off of work. Work is everything to them. And I'm trying to tell you, this is, I, I tell this to my boss. He told me, and he told the rest of us, he goes, corporate says, from now on, there will be no overtime. You know what I said? Yes! I was excited. He was like, does that mean I'm not a team player? Because that used to be something that was almost mandated of that we would perform overtime. I mean, I used to average 15, 16 to 20 hours of overtime. Now, by an act of Congress, no overtime. Oh, that really breaks my, I should have kind of acted because, you know, Pastor Ben could be a little flamboyant. I should have said, no way! I mean, we have to get approval for 15 minutes of overtime. I'm so excited. We get to go home. We get to go home. And they even tell us, I'm just kind of sharing this with, about some of the things that I don't have any other tidbits, that they even, they recommend to us that you need to take time off. They tell us, you have to take a time off. Well, you're not breaking my arm off. I'm taking it as often as I can. So I'm thinking, what does this all mean? This is God's thing. God telling us to enjoy life, embrace life for what it is, and to, even to say this, that God came to give us life, and life more fulfilling, more abundantly, to enjoy the pleasures of God in your life. That the pleasures are you being single and being able to go wherever you want to serve in whatever capacity your God has ordained you to serve, then serve God in the capacity and do it with great joy. Amen. Do it with great passion. If it is you as a husband and wife, take your, 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 the couple that you are and serve God in the capacity God has given you and serve God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But enjoy the process, because that's what God has given us, amen? <clears throat> laughter a day. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm only laughing because I want to share it with you uh, with this last point. Um, how sometimes, there's a book out, if you want to read up and strengthen your marriage. Uh, his name is uh, Gary Smalley, has a great book out, and talks, tells about marriage and I want to credit him on a lot of stuff that I've gained over the years, even when I counsel here in the church when it comes to married couples. You know, because Pastor Ben, I can take my Bible out and kind of share with you and give you biblical counseling and give you biblical insight on how your marriage should work. But when it comes to the professional counseling, 
I leave that to the professionals. And of course I have, those of you that have come with me, you know that I have a resource outside the church that will help you during those most more difficult things that you struggle in marriage. But you know, I, I, I bring you to bring you Gary Smalley because he always says this when he has these conferences with pastors. He always tells them when you counsel about marriage or even when you expound about marriage behind your pulpit, why do you always say marriage is not easy? You think about that. That's your, usually our first line. Marriage is not easy. I'll take you down this path. Why I, I, I'm heading down that. This is 1 Peter chapter 3. If you're taking notes. Very similar to Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes something similar and so does Peter. They're like-minded. He says, wives. In the same way, submit yourself to your own husband, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without, with, with, without words by the behavior of their wives. You see that? When they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So I want you to look at that. I have it underlined by the behavior. Okay, and then it says for husbands. Uh, it says, husbands, in the same way, be what? Consider it as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partner, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. So, I want to emphasize those two words. And God is trying to tell us something here when he, when he talks about how we are having testimony towards one another as husbands and wives. Ephesians 5 says, and the two become one flesh. What testimony do we as married couples show the world? Think about that real quick. You ever go to a restaurant? You go to a restaurant, a husband and wife? We went to a Chinese restaurant in Lincoln Center, and we have a great friend there. She watches us all the time. I don't know why she watches us, but when Sister Lou and I go to a restaurant, you can tell this. Pastor Bear, I love to eat, right? I love to eat. And so a lot of times when I get my food, we say grace, and it's time to eat. Uh, Ecclesiastes, man, there's a time to talk and there's a time to eat, right? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. But so that you understand that, right? But for some reason or another, she saw us. And Sister Lou and I, when we talk, you know, we laugh and we, we're engaged with one another. And, you know, and, you know we, we're, we're, we're conversing one to another. And she watched us the whole time. And as we were, got our check, she goes, you guys are a nice couple. Because she goes, because you talk to your wife, and your wife talks to you, and you laugh. And she goes, not Chinese people. <laughs> she was Chinese, right? I, I, I'm not getting ethnic here, OK? But she just said that. And she goes, because the husband, he eats, and that's it. And I kind of started saying that, and I said, well, maybe, maybe, I told her, maybe it, he's just very busy. You know, Pastor Ben's always going to bring a better, a better perspective on that. And I says, she just gazed, and again, there's a certain testimony that we as Christian couples should have. In other words, when we are at a restaurant, is it all about eating? I can get the men there, it's all women. It, it should be about listening and talking so that the world sees you, that they see married couples that bow their heads and give grace, thanksgiving for the providence that God has provided for them, but they see that we're engaged one to another, that we're talking to each other. And so when the world sees this, they see that there are rings on our fingers and they see that we're truly not, you know, disengaged. You, you know, I don't have my phone on me, but I know that my wife, she doesn't like this when I do this, but when I'm eating, all of a sudden, my cell phone will be right here. And sometimes, I'll take that cell phone, and I'll look, and she'll go, she'll look at me, and I'll look over at couples, and I'm thinking, this is Pastor Ben now, okay? I'll look over at couples, and I'll say, Look at that husband and wife. Are they texting to one another? <laughs> Do you ever see that? They have their heads down and they're like this. 
And then I saw myself, I had my phone on there, and I'm like, because <laughs> I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. In fact, I think when you go to dinner, if you're a couple, cell phones in the pocket. Cell phones in the purses. And if they ring, exactly. It's your time to be as a couple. You know, I mean, I, I think about this. It's only been 10 years since the first brick came out. I'm talking about the cell phone, right? What did we do without those? Right? What did we do without a cell phone back 10 years ago? I don't know if we're happy, but I, I'll be honest with you. It's just one more distraction. And when you go to dinner and you're with your loved one, I mean, think about it. Did you go, do you know what just passed? It was Valentine's Day. And I'm thinking, how many times have they celebrated this holiday since the, the invention of the cell phone and you took your beloved wife on a romantic dinner only to have her sit, she's gorgeous, she's radiant on the other side of the table, and here you are. <laughs> What kind of testimony is that? You know, and all you have to do, let me take it back a little bit. When you were dating that person, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't give your phone the time of day. It would always be about staring on the other side of the table. Remember those days, guys? I mean, you were so much in love with this person, you couldn't help but just stare at them, talk to them, engage with them. Five years removed from that, you're married now, you're busy, you're eating, you don't even communicate anymore. And God is trying to tell us to take the opportunity, let your light so shine, even as a couple. Let people see that we as Christian couples, we do engage with one another, we, we're happy, we're in love with one another. And when they see that, again, no matter what the statistics may say, how in Christianity, marriage couples, maybe a certain statistics show that we're not doing really well in marriage, but the thing is, this is something how we can make an impact in Christ Jesus. When people see that a love that we have, we share one for another, when the two become one flesh. This is God ordained, and as God has saw us through various things of technology that we still manage, and I use the word manage to, what, to communicate one to another so that we could hear testimonies like what we heard from one lady I love you guys as a couple you always talk to each other and I love that that's a beautiful testimony because I, I said to myself this is a personal challenge to Pastor Ben I don't ever want to be out there where people watch us and as they watch us they don't see me busy doing something else Busy not paying attention to my wife. Busy doing anything else. You know what? It's even with my children. When I'm with my kids and we're out uh, in a restaurant, I, I think about that. The 21st century, have you ever been to a restaurant where everybody at the table has a cell phone? That's a sad testimony, right? And I'm thinking that we can't talk. You know, we can't laugh around the dinner table, you know, and I, I, some of the greatest memories that I have with my family, and there's always one, and I'll, I'll just say that there's always one individual in our family, we had eight in our family, and we used to always go to this restaurant called Don Chai, downtown Stock. And we'd always go there, and we'd sit around in our nice booth, and we'd always pick on one kid. You know, that was the fun times, you know what I'm talking about, right? And we'd always laugh, and we'd poke fun one to another, and the laughter from our one booth would just, just emanate throughout the whole restaurant. And people would know that we, we were the reversals. We were having so much fun as a family. And, it didn't, and my dad was not so stern where he would say, you guys stop that. No, my dad would just jump in. He would jump in, and he would laugh just as hard. And because that was what we wanted to emanate towards people. And that's what God wants us when we think about, you know, laughter being the best medicine. Learning to engage with the world in a sense to say, we're loving people and we know how to have fun. 
It's the same way here at Bethany Christian Center. We're a small community. But isn't that isn't it a wonderful thing that we can come to church? As we come to church, sometimes we can have fun. Sometimes we can even laugh. And those of you, as I pointed you out, those of you that are at a certain age and you were raised a certain way, well, you can laugh. Your creator, God, allowed this emotion to take place in your life so that every wonderful part of your face can show this expression of laughter. You know, I think about laughter and how, again, I will always remember some of my friends that I, I'm in the industry, in the medical field, some of the most boisterous laughs I ever heard. A great girl, I mean, this, this a great co-worker of mine, a nurse, her name was Sylvia Lopez. She had one of the most incredible laughs that I'll never forget. And you know what, when I heard her laughing, it just reminded me, no matter how difficult the day is, it's going to be a good day. And it's a reminder to us, as, as Christians, learn to embrace life in the way that God had planned it. Enjoy it. Enjoy life. I want to show this video clip from you. It's uh, Ken Davis. And this is about a husband who for the first time, maybe not for the first time, but he's going to express his feelings to his wife, okay? Okay? He's going to express his feelings to his wife. This is Ken Davis. I'm close with that. We go up here real quick. Well, I want to know what's happening inside. I want to know what you're feeling. I don't know how to do that. We're down in Jacksonville. We're driving to Florida. And we're in Jacksonville. We're at an intersection. And we stop at the intersection. I look across the street. I've recently lost about 30 pounds over the last year. And I don't want to gain it back. And I see a restaurant across there that I love to eat at, used to love to eat at. It's a good place, but I just can't eat there very much anymore. It's really sad. <laughs> and it hit me. That's a feeling. <laughs> so I decided to communicate it in my man way. This happened verbatim. I said, Duncan Donut. And she said, what? <laughs> and I didn't think she had heard me, so I said, don't condone it. <laughs> and she said, what? <laughs> Within 30 seconds, we are at each other's throats. <laughs> Finally, I just turned to her, and I was not nice. I said, what part of Duncan Donut don't you understand? And she turned to me and said, don't condone what? <laughs> I said, I didn't say don't condone it. I said don't condone it. There's a difference. I do not, I do not like do not. <laughs> That's just a clip that kind of shows us that we don't really listen to each other. You know what, there's classes on how to learn to speak. You know, you could go to classes and they'll teach you how to speak to audiences, but there's not a class that teaches you how to listen. You know what, that's something I think we as Christians need to learn to do. We need to learn to listen. You know, as a pastor, that's something I've had to learn to just put it in neutral. When somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, man, I need to talk to you. Because as pastors, and maybe as a, as a man, we want to fix. Right? We want to fix it. But as a pastor, I've had to learn to throttle back and just say, be quiet, Ben. And just listen to what they have to say first. And then even tell them, okay, 
Well, are you done? So that they'll know that I'm engaged in them. You know, and a lot of times, most people just want you to hear them out anyway. True. And so, that, again, uh, years of wisdom has taught me over the years. And so I, I'm here, and it's a reminder when I, I, I see these Christian comedians that know how to poke fun at the body of Christ in ways that can teach us to learn to communicate one to another, but mostly can we learn to have fun and laugh at ourselves and at the world. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord.